Hello, I'm McGee Hickey. Welcome to Guided by Grace. Oh, those teenage years. Do you remember yours? Are your children currently at this stage in their lives? Are you a teenager yourself? Well, during this pivotal age, many of our values can be strengthened or influenced by those around us. Today, I'm looking forward to discussing this stage of the growing process. Hello, everyone. We all remember teenage years, yes. right? Indeed. And you, Carly Ann, and you, Megan, work with teenagers, and you do too, Allison. Um, so how do we begin this talking about teenage years? I mean, I remember my own and being so confused, and luckily I had these very strong parents with a very, you know, now everyone talks about moral compass, but with very much a strong sense of right and wrong, and this is what you should do, and this is what you should not do, mm -hmm. compassionately caring about mm -hmm. those years. Mm -hmm. What do you see yeah. with the teenagers you're working with? Well, it can be a tumultuous time. I think uh, a lot of teenagers are trying to find their identity. They're mm -hmm. trying to find out who they are. They're trying to establish their autonomy. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult because they're maybe not quite mature enough to have the autonomy that they wish they had, but at the same time, growing more in responsibility. So it's a tough time with a lot of tricky balance going on and I can remember my own years it was tough but like you I had some very very strong people in my life my parents good influences some good teachers and great friends and I think that kept me balanced and above all faith mm -hmm. um, and that is something that we try to foster I think in the work that we do is to try to give um, our teenagers a grounding about who they are and their dignity in mm -hmm. the faith in the Catholic mm -hmm. faith. Megan what are you seeing with your teenagers? <clears throat> I think, um, I think teenagers in general are very strong personalities, mm. any way you look at that, and that can be a struggle for adults. Um, I think society overall, it, the influences, you know, as much as you want the, the positive and the good morals and the, the strict parents and the guidelines, society is running rampant with choices that are not what necessarily we would want them to make. Right. And I think we have to help them see that even though this may look popular and fun, is that really being true to who you are? Sure. Or are you just falling into the trap of what everybody else is doing, yeah. which is just ridiculous? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, what I love about the teenager is the energy. You know, it's, they're bouncing all over the place, and you know, that's good, but it, it does need to be channeled in a meaningful way. And I, and I think a lot that what, what we talk about and what we, the area we try to push them in is so countercultural. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we're saying one thing, yet the culture is screaming something else, do this, you know, you'll be more popular, you'll be better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what is important to root at that age is their identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, who are they? Yeah. You know, and, and the faith does a lot of that. And, and if you can find somebody that can meaning, meaningfully communicate that, to them where they can get it on their level, I think that's gonna be a, a great resource for them. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out a way how to communicate, you know, who they are or what their mission is and then and then work with them and try not to be this force that's gonna really, yes. you know, crack them down and, you know, say, you know, you're out. Right. And, and peer like the pressure is just so, you know, they don't wanna listen to parents or the church mm -hmm. or the sister in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, they want, to do what is cool. Right. And it's so important to send the message that you don't have to do anything and you mm. can actually be cool. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Chastity. Yeah. Wait. Wait. I was always so big with my two daughters in their teenage years. The coolest girl in the room is not the girl who's leading the pack and mm -hmm. most in charge of bad behavior. She's going to regret what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And behind her back, she's going to be called names. Sure. Hold back. Mm -hmm. Chastity is a virtue. Let's talk about chastity. First off, Allison, correct me on this. We were talking earlier before the show about a chaste marriage. It's such an interesting concept. Yeah. I, I've been married now 32 years. <laughs> and when you said, oh, you're in a chaste marriage, I said, no, I'm not. You know, <laughs> um, it's a uh, <laughs> scary. <laughs> right, right. Mean? But define that for us because yeah, I, I learned something. And I didn't know that. There's a lot of confusion out there. And, and I think this might scare off some people mm -hmm. or might you know, think, whoa, this is not for me, you know, let's not go there. But uh, there is a difference between abstinence and chastity. And abstinence is just exactly that, abstaining from sex. And, you know, people may choose to do that in um, different areas of their life. But we talk more about something that's meaningful. We talk about chastity, which is a virtue, one of mm -hmm. the virtues. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's a way of life. So it means that you're chaste or you're committed to your vocation. So if you're a married person, husband or wife, 
Um, you're living a chaste life. You're committed to your vocation. Or another way to look at just being faithful, faithful to your vows. I that's mean, exactly right. When you right. get married so, yeah. in the church, it doesn't say you can have partners outside. That's right. So you're faithful to your vows. You're, you're yes. chaste. You're living within the commitment of that vocation that you have, whether you're married, unmarried, mm -hmm. you're a religious mm -hmm. person. And, and I think that meaning helps people a little bit better to understand why the church speaks what the church speaks. It's like vocabulary is such an important thing. I mean, I was an English teacher prior to um, entering the convent and becoming a theology teacher. And the words we use, like first of all, chastity, people hear that and they like want to run and hide. Right. And it's like, what? You know, you can use other words that aren't appropriate and it's accepted as the norm. Mm -hmm. So um, do you not use the word chastity? We in do. The I do use the mm -hmm. word chastity. Yes, because even as Allison was saying, when you, even you think of vocation, so often people think vocation, religious life, or priest. Well, that's that's not true either. Mm -hmm. You have a vocation to married life, or to religious life, or to the single life, and within that vocation is chastity mm -hmm. for everybody. And with all vocations, are love. Right. Exactly. So, and that's the whole point. And it's just about enlarging our hearts, like making yeah. our hearts yeah. bigger to love more and to love one another more right. within whatever relationship. Let me just give you right. some really startling statistics to me. According to the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, 47% of high school students have admitted to having sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. So we're almost up to 50% there. Mm -hmm. And if they don't realize there are serious risks, mm -hmm. HIV, nearly 10,000 young adults were diagnosed with HIV, unintended pregnancy, 273,000 babies born to girls, aged 15 to 19, sexually transmitted diseases, nearly half of the 20 million new STDs are young people aged 15 to 24. How do you talk to your young students and your young students mm -hmm. to say, wait, you know, there's the moral and even just the physical mm -hmm. problems with being sexually active? Well, sometimes it's a, it's a difficult conversation in, in our school because it is, um, Our Lady of Mercy is a Catholic private school. We obviously go by all the church teachings and but you still have to go with what are the medical or the health risks of being sexually active. And you can't assume with those statistics that kids are not going to be active, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, even just, you know, I did an assignment the other day and it was saying to find a TV show or a book that you like and see if it's moral. Mm. And mm. we couldn't come up with any. Right. Because, you know, either it, it's got uh, adultery in it or they're trying to hook up with somebody, they sleep, and they don't show that part of it. They mm -hmm. don't show an STD or HIV mm -hmm. after these people are being sexually active. Mm -hmm. So we try to look at the reality and change it around that way. Yeah. All right, we're going to continue this discussion because there's so much more. But right now we're going to take a quick break. Coming up, we're going to be joined by a few young missionaries from the Culture Project, whose goal is to share the message of the dignity of each human person and the call for us to live lives of sexual integrity. You don't want to miss the common dream that they are fighting to achieve. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to Guided by Grace. Joining us now are some wonderful volunteers from the Culture Project. They are missionaries who have set out to restore culture through the experience of virtue. And they envision a world where human dignity is at the forefront of every relationship. What a unique concept. <laughs> it should be at the forefront of every relationship, law, and societal structure. Welcome Lamar Edwards and Kayla Stedelman. Thank you for being here. So it's wonderful. I mean, I'm so interested to hear what exactly is your mission? Well, our mission uh, exists to invite young people to live lives of radical virtue and to become fully alive, to become fully themselves. Uh, what is that radical virtue? Radical virtue. It's, um, well, honestly, virtue, we talk about it as being a daily choice, that you make good habits with your thoughts and your actions. So really just making the radical choice every single day when you wake up to choose to love in every moment that you can, which isn't easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. I'm just wondering as well, your tagline is inviting our culture to be fully alive. You want to speak about that a little bit more, about how to get the culture fully alive? Yeah, you know, being fully alive, uh, maybe it's like a little bit of a fancy, even a secular way of saying mm. to become saints. Mm. So our mission really exists, and, and we really believe in the fact that virtue doesn't make us less of who we are. Mm. You know, there are times where young people think like, oh, the church says this or that and these rules and regulations, like they prevent me from being free. Mm -hmm. When really, 
what virtue does, because it is positive and it forges us into better men and women, virtue makes us more of who we are and more of who we were created to be, mm -hmm. giving us a sense of freedom to live and to love. That's uh, interesting. I was teaching my class the other day, and we said to be holy, the definition of holy in the book I'm using is to be fully alive. So that's really, wow. yeah, isn't that that's wild? Great. That's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> this is like a little God sighting in my class. We do that yeah. too, and everything's mm -hmm. connected that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to be holy is to be fully alive. Mm -hmm. um, I think your group deals with self-love also, is that correct? And why is it important for the, the teenagers and adolescents to realize self-love? Yeah, I, especially in our culture, I know as a woman, it is very easy to, to not love who you are mm -hmm. in either your body image or the way that people talk to you or you talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so really it's foundational to learn to love who you are. And like, what does it mean to be a woman? Or of course, what does it mean to be a man? Mm -hmm. And how do we love who we are first and recognize that we love who we are because God loves us and he created us in a way that is worthy of love. And from there, we can go out and really love one another well. Mm -hmm. So it's really the foundation. That's excellent, very yeah. important. And I just want to say I love the commitment that you have to this because without the commitment, you know, it's really hard to get this message across. Um, so when you're working with teens and when you're, you're speaking with them, what are some of the ways that you can suggest that teens can find love and acceptance where they're at? Well, I know personally it was really big for me to go to college and meet people who were living out this lifestyle themselves. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even being told what to do, but someone showing me what to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was very big for me to get involved, to, to meet community, to mm -hmm. meet people who were interested in their faith and living out chastity, mm -hmm. but then also getting involved in service. So in college, mm -hmm. I, I got involved in different clubs that were service, or I went on mission trips. Mm -hmm. So different outlets such as those that mm -hmm. allow you to meet the right people and it draws you out of yourself. Mm -hmm. It allows you to focus on the other person, mm -hmm. not like, what's wrong with me? Or how do I need to change myself? Or how do I need to make myself lovable? Mm -hmm. You focus on how can I love another person better? So you go out and talk to teenagers all the time about abstaining from sex and sexual activity. And that must yeah. be a really hard sell in our culture. <laughs> <laughs> how do you explain to them that leading a chaste life can actually strengthen relationships? Mm. Well, when we talk about the virtue of chastity, we do really emphasize the, the stark contrast between abstinence and chastity and how chastity really gives us the freedom to love and to love well. Um, and, and that that is really like the, um, the impetus of why we're there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that like virtue, the concept of virtue in and of itself demands like practice and that if we make a habit out of loving rightly and loving well now, maybe as a high school boy, uh, you know, I challenge a kid to open up a door for a girl, let her walk in. Those actions now are going to help him be faithful and love his wife unconditionally 10, 15, 20 years from that moment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And do you guys have stories maybe, anything particular, like anecdotal, about interaction with students that you've encountered, male and female? Mm. One story that I can think of like off the top of my head, I remember I was at a parish in New Orleans and it was the parish that actually had the highest um, sexual activity in, in the whole archdiocese. And I was speaking to a group of about 20 boys and we got to a point in the presentation where we were talking about struggles of living out chastity, a life of sexual integrity. And specifically we were talking about the problem of pornography. Mm -hmm. and, and I was giving them resources and really encouraging them to, to let them know that they have the ability to overcome this. And this one kid, he was like the class clown. He was giving me problems the whole time. At this point of the talk, he raises his hand and he's fighting back tears. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, Mr. Lamar, do you really believe that this is something I can overcome? Wow. And I almost broke down in front of the whole <laughs> class. Uh, and it was great to, to have a moment. Mm -hmm. You talk about like uh, being able to speak love and acceptance mm -hmm. and finding that in the culture to be able to give that affirmation to him in that moment like yes you are capable and you have everything that you need inside of you to not over not only overcome temptation but to flourish and live a life of freedom mm -hmm. that's such an important message i mean that it can start at any age mm. i mean yeah. this decision it doesn't Absolutely. have to be like 
you're a virgin and say, okay, I'm going to be chaste. Yeah. Yeah. You can change. You can turn your life around. Mm -hmm. It must be something yes. you talk about with your teens. Oh, well, sure. I mean, every day you, you start anew. You know, whatever happened two minutes ago, you can change that. Mm -hmm. Learn from whatever, if it was a mistake or if it was a positive experience, learn from it start over. And, and move on. Yeah. I mean, if we didn't have that, what kind of loving God do we have? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's always that yeah. forgiveness and, and moving forward in, in our lives. Yeah. And that's a huge honor about getting to do this work mm -hmm. is that Lamar and I and all of our teammates, we go into those classrooms, into those churches, not because we're perfect, not because we have mm -hmm. chastity mm -hmm. perfectly down, but because we are broken, we are weak. Mm -hmm. and, that, and every single day we too have to make this choice mm -hmm. to love and to go outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, and getting to speak about mercy, mm -hmm. getting to speak about mm -hmm. starting over, mm -hmm. like getting to go to confession or seeking to be made new every time mm -hmm. because we're not perfect. <laughs> we need grace. <laughs> I've actually seen firsthand, you know, uh, <clears throat> some of the talks and the interactions that your teams have had with the, with the students in separate, <clears throat> separate uh, rooms, boys in one room, girls in another. And I, was, I have been really happily surprised at the response of the young girls that have really approached the speaker mm -hmm. right after the talk with questions and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the believability and the influence. Mm -hmm. And I think young people are really want to embrace the freedom, but it's a matter of how do you keep it going? Mm -hmm. You know, what, where's mm -hmm. the reinforcement to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, where are the positive forces? Yeah, 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 they are. Yeah. And when they yeah. encounter integrity mm -hmm. and authenticity, they know it's real. Yeah. And mm -hmm. children and teenagers mm -hmm. call out you know, inauthenticity. Exactly. I was to think yeah. of another word. Uh -huh. Very, yeah. very quickly. It's very quickly. Yeah. And they respond wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is, is a gift to you guys, too. You mm -hmm. know, because it takes a lot to, to do that every day, what, we, what you're doing, you know, to present mm -hmm. and to give your whole hearts and to live what you, what you say. But that mm -hmm. is the gift in return. What mm -hmm. advice, yes. we have time only for one last question, and I'll ask it. Um, <laughs> what advice do you give to teens? Mm -hmm. um, well, in addition to the many, many practicals that we give them, whether it's in their friendships or in their relationships or in acts of service that prepare them um, to live lives of sexual integrity, the biggest and most fundamental practical that we, we will give is, is prayer. Mm. Is that the virtue-driven life, a life of yeah. any kind of integrity, um, is only possible with the grace mm. that God gives. Um, so prayer and uh, running to the sacrament of confession whenever they fall, these are, these are the, the, the most pivotal foundational practicals we could give. And they can go to your website, too, for Absolutely. help. Seriously, I mean, if they're feeling weak or they need yeah. some direction. So where do they find your website? What is it? It's www.restoreculture.com. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great information. Thank you so much for being with us here, Lamar Edwards and Kayla Stettelman. We have to take a quick break right now, but don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back with more Guided by Grace right after this. Hello and welcome back to Guided by Grace. In order to build healthier relationships all around, we must first learn how to live a fulfilled life by finding happiness within ourselves first. Today on our book club segment, we're talking about The Thrill of the Chaste. It's a newly released Catholic edition and joining us via Skype is the author, Dawn Eden. Hi, Dawn. Dawn, you, you've led such an interesting life. You were a journalist, you worked at the Daily News and New York Post, you you were first raised Jewish and then you converted to Protestantism and now you're a Catholic. Why did you write this book and tell us about your journey? Oh, well, uh, thank you so much for, for asking. It has been quite a journey. As you say, I was born into a Jewish family in Westchester County, uh, New, New York. Uh, and then uh, it wasn't until my uh, 30s uh, that I received uh, the grace of uh, conversion to Christianity, and uh, it was a few years after that that I became Catholic. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote The Thrill of the Chaste because when I first started living the Christian walk, I hadn't always been chaste. I had been a rock journalist uh, in New York City. Uh, I had written for magazines like Mojo and Billboard. Uh, I had also uh, interviewed oldies artists for uh, liner notes to CDs, artists like Harry Nilsson and Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Uh, and uh, when, when I was 
living in that world, uh, in that rock rock world, uh, I didn't have any uh, understanding of chastity, and there really weren't people around me to uh, to tell me about it. Uh, so, uh, as a new uh, Christian, uh, before I was Catholic, I went to the uh, book section of my local bookstore to try to find a book on chastity, and all I could find were books on teen purity. And I have to tell you, uh, if you're 31 and you're looking for guidance and all the books are are about staying a virgin till marriage, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> so once I got started to practice chastity, I decided to write the book that I wished had been there for me. Uh, and so that was the original thrill of the chaste. And now I've been able to write this new Catholic edition where I'm able to uh, really uh, enlarge uh, the understanding of chastity that I put forth at first to really uh, put it within the rhythms of the sacraments, which have become so important uh, for me in my own faith journey. So, you know, I'm just wondering a little bit about your faith journey and about uh, vulnerability, because there's a chapter in the book that speaks a little bit about vulnerability. How did that play out for you in terms of maybe past wounds or healing? Just speak to that a little bit if you could. Well, I'm so glad you asked because one of the differences in this new Catholic edition of The Thrill of the Chaste and the first one is that when I wrote uh, the first ed edition before I was Catholic, I really hadn't uh, addressed my childhood wounds. It was only after the publication of that first edition uh, that I began to uh, get help, the help I needed uh, as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. If I bring my own wounded heart to the wounded and glorified heart of Christ, then my own wounds become like the cracks that the light from his glorified wounds can get in and bring me healing. You know, before, it, it's interesting to listen to your views <clears throat> as you were going through, through your conversions, but did you have any, um, any views bef on chastity before you converted to Catholicism? That's a great question. Uh, well, uh, cer certainly uh, before I uh, received the, the light of, of Christian faith, uh, I was uh, not interested in chastity, and I assumed uh, that uh, the Church's sexual teachings were uh, in some way uh, to keep women down. And so uh, as a Catholic, uh, what I've discovered is that uh, in the secular world, I was sold a bill of goods because I look back now on uh, the unchaste life that I used to, to live and I see that I was told by the secular world, I was told by people who called themselves feminists uh, that it was truly free uh, to engage in sex outside of marriage and that this was how I was coming into my fullness as a woman. Uh, but in fact, these things that the culture told me to do that would supposedly make me happy, left me lonely, left me unhappy, left me not able to have uh, true intimacy. Uh, because uh, what I've learned is that you can't seek permanence through impermanence. What I really wanted was to be able to love and be loved. And now, living chastely, even though uh, I'm not married, and in fact, since becoming Catholic, I've made a personal consecration of my celibacy. But even when I was uh, dating and hoping for marriage as a Catholic, I was experiencing more love and was more loving than when I was living unchastely. Uh, in the New Catholic edition of The Thrill of the Chaste, I talk about how really the definition of, of chastity as a virtue is loving fully and completely in every relationship according to what is appropriate for that type of relationship. Do you think it's ever too late, this is McGee again, um, to change your life? I mean, you did it in your late 20s, early 30s. If someone's listening to this now and think, I want to be like Dawn. Is it ever too late? No, it's never too late to change. And I can't stress this enough. Uh, because uh, the grace of God is greater than all our sins, and the grace of God is also greater than all the sins that anyone has 
committed against us. I know that for myself as a survivor of sexual abuse, when I became Catholic, I felt that even though I had confessed my own sins, I was afraid that I couldn't be pure because of what had been done to me. But I've learned uh, that I am not responsible for the sins that others committed against me when I was a child. Oh, so interesting. If anyone wants to find out more, they can buy the book on the website. Is that correct, Dawn? So they yeah. can go to your website, dawneden.blogspot.com. That's and right. And there's a link to purchase. Thank you so much for talking with us, Dawn. It's so That's interesting. Good. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank as you. Well. We want to thank all our guests, also our guests at The Culture Project, once again for being with us. We will leave you now with a prayer for the strength to be pure. It is short and powerful, something easy to memorize for when we need to call upon it. Lord, inflame our hearts and our inmost beings with the fire of your Holy Spirit, that we may serve you with chaste bodies and pure minds. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And that's all the time we have for today. On behalf of my co-hosts, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Guided by Grace.